Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to the second last lecture of this particular course, Gender and Literature. So we are into the final segment of this course, as you know. So we're talking about films, advertisements, uh, particularly advertisements, and we've seen certain selected advertisements uh, from the perspective of gender studies. We talked about how uh, certain advertisements play up different kinds of performativity, different kinds of you know, embodiment, and how those are related uh, to the cultural condition of those times. Uh, we talked about how uh, the, the location of the consumer is very important, uh, who is watching it, who is uh, viewing it, uh, who is a potential consumer of this kind of advertisement. So we talked about that in some details uh, in the last couple of lectures. So uh, what we'll do today, we'll, we'll move away from the advertisements, we'll, uh, we'll play one little clip from a film, a very famous film. Uh, it's a film called The Godfather, which uh, many of you may have seen already. Uh, it's a very familiar scene. Uh, but we we'll look at this particular scene from the perspective of gender studies, and we we'll talk about things like, uh, you know, performativity, gender identity, etc. But before I move into the scene, so before I actually uh, uh, show you the screen and begin to talk about it, uh, I'll just go back a little bit to uh, one of the topics which we had discussed uh, some time earlier, because it's a very key topic uh, in, in relation to the scene as well. It's a topic which uh, you know, encapsulates the relationship between space and identity, especially uh, gendered identity. So to what extent is space gendered? To what extent does uh, space generate a uh, gendered identity? So and if you remember, and I'm sure you do, uh, the, the, the first short story which we did in this course, the first literary text which we covered in this course, which was Munshi Premchand's uh, Shatan Shikilari. Right? Now, in that particular short story, if you remember, uh, we talk a lot about uh, space and identity and gender. So, you know, certain spaces allowed certain kinds of gender behavior, certain spaces disallowed uh, certain other kinds of gender behavior. So, gender, uh, the embodiment of gender, the speciality of gender was something that we, uh, you know, looked at in that particular short story. So, you know, for instance, if you remember, you know, we, we saw how uh, the Divan Khana, which is a drawing room of the Nawab's house, uh, you know, the, the, the courtier's house, you know, that is, you know, obviously a male space, it's a male homosocial space where women are not allowed to enter except uh, perhaps as servants um, serving barn and other kind of food stuff. Uh, now, that, that particular space, you know, the woman of the house, the wife of, uh, you know, the Nawab, the wife of the courtier, uh, she enters very, very uh, ambivalently, so she's not sure, I mean, she obviously wants to enter and disrupt the game, she's very angry uh, and she has lots of human reasons to be angry. But you know, she is sort of ambivalent and hesitant before entering the space because that is a very clearly coded male space. Uh, which brings me uh, to the, the idea of coding, the entire notion of coded space. Because one of the things which we have been talking about since the very inception of this course is the very coded quality of gender identities. Right? So to what extent is gender coded? Uh, so what are the codes of gender? Right? Uh, so how do these codes, how are these codes determined by cultural conditions, how are these codes determined by prevalent political conditions, how are these codes determined by ideological conditions, religious conditions, linguistic conditions, etc. So all these factors uh, are very deeply and complexly enmeshed with each other, uh, as we have seen uh, through the entirety of this course, really. So uh, that particular short story by Prem Chand, it, it is it's very deliberate, I mean, it, it sort of dramatizes the very clear division of gender roles, gender performativity, gender identities. And it's a very tragic story from the perspective of the, uh, the female, because if you look at the, uh, the, the, the females in the, in the short story, the female figures in the short story, you find as, there's a very clear indication that they uh, have more intelligence, they are more intuitive, they have you know, a better control, uh, a better grasp of reality than the men uh, who obviously wild away the time playing chess and you know, in complete inaction, uh, in an absolute absorption, uh, in an unreal game which doesn't really require them uh, to have any real engagement with the real world. Uh, and that's the kind of setting that uh, Prem Chad had chosen because obviously this was, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, the imperial setting. This was uh, a very feudal Lucknow setting where men didn't really have to, the, the rich men, the wealthy men didn't really have to work. Uh, it's that condition which is showcased in the short story, against which, in the backdrop of which, we have this you know, very interesting play of gender and gendered identity. Uh, and we saw the woman there, uh, the woman figures there. Uh, so they, one of them, so the, there's reference to two women in the short story, and one of them, uh, she manages to manipulate the space uh, and her, to her benefit. So she wants her husband to be away deliberately so that she can do things of her own. I mean, we're never told what she does, really, but there's a very implicit, a very subtle suggestion that she's perhaps uh, into some kind of an activity which would otherwise not be possible uh, in the presence of the husband. So you know, she would obviously want the husband to be away so that she can manipulate the space and use it to her benefit because she's confined to the space. So she's obviously going to manipulate the space in which she is confined, right? Because you know, uh, there are other spaces which are disallowed to her. Uh, you know, she doesn't have access to those spaces. So space is a very gendered phenomenon. So space is obviously a construct. Uh, so that's the reason why I'm using the word space and not place because you know, a place is more geographical, a place is more physical, a place is more empirical perhaps. But you know, the process in which a place becomes a space is, is a very discursive process. Right? Uh, it, there are a lot of apparatus, a lot of um, material apparatus, abstract apparatus, ideological apparatus which go into the formation of a space. Right? So when I say this is an imperial space, uh, this is a homosocial space, this is a, a post-colonial space, so all these are very loaded terms. Right? Uh, it's, it's, the, you know, it's an indicative of the fact that you know, there's a process, a discursive process, an ideological process through which um, you know, the entire conversion happens, and the entire conversion from the real geographical topos to a more psychic topos uh, you know, takes place. Right? Now, uh, obviously, you know, if you go back, uh, almost all the stories that we have covered, almost all the texts that we have covered in this particular uh, course would, you know, would, at some point or other, they had uh, a reference to space and reference to, uh, you know, to what kind of spaces correspond to what kind of coded behavior in terms of gender. So, you know, just to give you a, a rough idea, so we, we just talked about Prem Chand's Shatan Shikilari or the chess players, but obviously uh, even the other stories which we did, they too have a very complex depiction of space, especially uh, when it comes to the relationship with gender. So, for instance, if you remember, you know, the short story, The Fly, you know, over there, uh, the two men sit with each other, you know, they drink whiskey, uh, they uh, sort of engage in a very manly conversation, but obviously they're, they're decadent, they're weak, they're senile. One of them is uh, trying, to, trying to cover up his weakness uh, through this entire assortment uh, of so this entire architecture uh, of newness around him, uh, of apparatus, of gadgets around him. But obviously that, the entire center crumbles in the end, as you see in the short story. But you know, the important thing is to remember that there is no female present in that space. Or in, in, it's almost as if to say that no females are allowed access to that particular space. Right? It's a completely all-male space where the two men sit and have a conversation with each other uh, you know, about different activities, you know, to try to remember the dead sons, etc. So even the people who are remembered in that space are men. And the people who inhabit the space are men. And there are the, the female figures in, in Fly are obviously very complex because they are the people who travel uh, to the actual places, right? whereas the men create the spaces. Uh, so the women travel to the places, the real sites of loss, the real sites of mourning would actually go to Belgium to the real graveyard where the men are buried, where the boys are buried, and they happen to see, obviously, the grave, the tombs uh, of their you know, sons and you know, the friends' sons, uh, which they report back to the men who don't leave that particular space. So the office space in Fly uh, is very male, is very homosocial, is very gendered deeply, and it entails a certain kind of coded performance, a certain kind of coded behavior. Right? So the entire coded quality, the cryptic quality, the encoded quality of a space is what makes it uh, so definitely male or definitely female uh, in the case of uh, you know, the fly. And of course, uh, if you just come down, uh, you know, if you read the other texts as well, for instance, Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad, over there too, uh, it's, it's a bigger thing. Uh, it's more mappable. Right? So when, when Marlow goes to Congo, uh, that is an imperial space, obviously it's, it's heavily racialized. Only the white men speak in that space. The non-white people are not even given a voice. They don't have any language. Uh, no non-white persons speak uh, in, uh, in Congo, despite the fact that they are the original inhabitants there. There's not even an, an, any attempt on the part of the writer to translate what may, what may have been spoken uh, in that particular region. But we never get to know uh, any, of the, you know, any, any utterance, any inscription uh, from the uh, non-white people over there. So you know, it's not only that space is gendered, in Heart of Darkness is obviously deeply racialized um, as well. 
because you know it's a space which is converted by the imperial machinery into some kind of a profit principle. So Congo, which is definitely an African place, it belongs in Africa. Uh, the, the original inhabitants of the place are Africans, but obviously that is very conveniently effaced and very quickly becomes a Belgian colony where the only motive, the only principle is profit principle, where the company opens its offices there and the whole idea is to really make an enormous amount of profit uh, from uh, you know, ivory trade uh, in Congo. And that's why Malo is sent there and you know, he sort of becomes uh, more and more ambivalent about the whole imperial enterprise, etc. So, and, and more importantly, in Heart of Darkness, when Malo comes back to Brussels, when he comes back to the European white space, uh, he obviously has to forego the experiences that he had. Now, he tries to tell the story of what happened to him. And again, look at the space in which the story takes place in Heart of Darkness. Uh, the entire story is told uh, in, a, in, a, in a floating space. Quite literally, it becomes a floating signifier, River Thames, where the men sit on a boat, listen to Marlo, and obviously most of them go to sleep, except the narrator who tells the story, uh, Marlo's story to us. So, you know, there's a very complex combination of spaces in Heart of Darkness. And the woman in Heart of Darkness, uh, the, the, the two principal women in Heart of Darkness, one of them is obviously Kutz's uh, African mistress, who uh, unsurprisingly is never given a voice. She never speaks in Heart of Darkness. She's spoken about, she's exoticized, uh, and we only get to hear a wail from her, a scream from her, uh, perhaps a mourning scream from her when Kutz dies. And she becomes, she embodies uh, the exotic other. She embodies the, I mean, not just an other uh, from a female perspective, but an other from also a racial perspective, right? So she is doubly othered uh, and hence doub doubly marginalized uh, in many ways. Right? So she becomes, uh, and again, the location of her, she's located in that exotic space. Right? So that gives you an idea, again, of the relationship between space and gendered identity. So every kind, any kind of gendered identity is tied to its location in a particular space. You cannot possibly divorce the space from the identity because there are spaces which generate that identity uh, quite clearly and quite deliberately uh, and, and sometimes very dramatically. Now, again, in Heart of Darkness, when Malo comes back, to Brussels, uh, when you know he comes back to the European space, when he uh, has to meet uh, Kurtz's intended, his, his fiance, and tell her uh, about Kurtz, about his dying words, etc. Then, of course, he has to be uh, a misinformer. He has to lie about Kurtz's dying words because that space demands that lie. That space demands that he misinforms uh, what really transpired, uh, you know, in Congo. He misinforms about what really transpired in the Congo, right? So he cannot tell possibly uh, what happened in the Congo. He cannot tell possibly, he cannot convey completely uh, what really took place in Congo. So he has to sort of manufacture this romantic report, uh, uh, you know, for the purpose of conveying to Christus fiance, uh, who just stands there receiving the report very, very passively. So again, uh, her presence, uh, her passivity uh, is very, very gendered. So she is uh, sort of looked at, she, is, she may be interpreted as a typically uh, passive European woman uh, who is just very elegantly receiving a romantic report uh, about her fiancé who has died. And he, the, the, the dead person, a dead fiancé, is sort of uh, used or described in very romantic, glorious terms. Whereas we know the reality that he was actually a part of the imperial machinery of exploitation and then he went rogue. So he turned into a rogue agent uh, who had to be uh, exterminated, who had to be you know, either brought back or killed by another agent who went uh, for that particular purpose. So it's a very classic structure uh, where uh, a man, a male, uh, a male conqueror, a male adventurer goes into this exotic space, uh, you know, turns into a native, you know, becomes a native and then becomes a rogue from the perspective of the enterprise which had sent him. Uh, and of course, another agent is then sent um, you know, in order to either recover the rogue or to exterminate the rogue, kill him, uh, possibly. Now this structure, you, I'm sure you can find this structure in, in many, many uh, narratives, in, in many cinematic narratives, many adventure cinema narratives, many adventure story narratives, etc. Right? So again, the point is, the entire idea of space and gender uh, is extremely poignant and complex. Now, by the time we come to um, and a look back in anger, which is a very, very complex play because it's about the angry young man, it's about the emasculated young man, the cynical young man, uh, the young man who the only thing he can do is look back with some degree of bitterness, cynicism and anger uh, because he thinks that he's been exhausted uh, of all possibilities uh, and then of course he can't really function uh, you know, and he's so stagnant in a particular cultural condition which doesn't allow him to really act out uh, his agency uh, or so he thinks. So, you know, but Interestingly, the space in, Hado, in, in Look Back in Anger is a kitchen sink. And the, the entire action, almost the entirety of the action, uh, takes place in a very uh, intimate 
uh, domestic space of a particular household, the porter household. Because the simple thing is, there is no exotic space left. There is no sort of truly ideological space left. So the entire uh, the borderline between intimacy and ideology uh, has broken in look back in anger. Right, so it's, it's it's a play which really depicts and dramatizes the the disruption of the borderline. That, you know, there is no difference at all now between the ideological space and the intimate space. Okay, so the intimate becomes ideological, the ideological becomes intimate, the personal becomes the private, the private becomes the personal, and look back in anger. So no longer do we have an example of a male space or a female space. That's you know that that, that mapping uh, becomes quite sort of blurry. However, even within that very blurry mapping, we still have the presence of Jimmy through difference in the fire. So, for instance, if you remember the scene in Look Back in Anger, where the two women sit uh, and discuss Jimmy Porter, and from the background, we hear Jimmy from another room playing the jazz trumpet. Now, that jazz trumpet, the sound of the jazz trumpet from another room, that becomes a very male intrusive sound, which constantly disrupts the conversation between the two females. So, again, you find uh, you know, this very performative use of space, a very performative production of space. Right, a space is produced uh, out of a certain activity. When Jimmy walking into a room and playing a jazz trumpet, it produces a certain kind of masculinity, uh, which is sort of rebellious, you know, working class, anti-establishment, etc. But also, it's very, very masculine. So again, the entire idea is to produce a certain kind of space uh, through a certain kind of performance. So look back in anger too. It has all these ingredients uh, about uh, you know the very essential ingredients which inform the collusion between space and gendered identity okay and of course the church outside and look back in anger you know we just get to hear the sound of the church just like we get to hear the sound of J jimmy's uh, jazz trumpet the church outside becomes a space for establishment it becomes a space for conformity right so which is uh, a natural uh, you know, an ontological opposite of what jimmy wants to really be uh, in terms of his political and cultural uh, location right so you know as i just just took you through and all the texts that we've studied. So it's essential to understand, it's almost imperative to understand that you know, space is a very big and key element uh, in all these texts that we just uh, mentioned, that we've studied uh, for the purpose of the scores. So you know, whether it's Chatham Circulari, the chess players, whether it's look back in anger, whether it's the fly, whether it's uh, shooting an elephant, almost all the texts that we've studied in the scores, they correspond to a certain coded quality of a space which are performed and embodied. And again, so performativity, as a term I keep mentioning in almost all the lectures that we do over here, performativity is a very, very important uh, you know, ingredient in gender studies. So you cannot really have a gender study component without performativity. Right? Because you know, the entire idea of performativity is to uh, either uh, make a departure from a biological essentialism. So you know, if you're biologically essentialized, uh, you know, the performativity can help you uh, disrupt it, depart from it, and which is a very important departure to make. Or uh, and conversely, performativity can also conform to biological determinism. So you can actually conform, you can actually consolidate a biological determinism through performativity. Right? So, you know, but either way, you are conforming or deconstructing either way, uh, you know, you are dealing, you, you're negotiating with certain coded behavior. You're negotiating with certain codes, very fundamentally speaking. You're negotiating with certain codes. Uh, so the word code uh, keeps coming back in almost all the lectures. I mean, I use it uh, quite explicitly and extensively in the first couple of lectures, if you remember, uh, because, you know, we are dealing essentially, when we're looking at gender, we're dealing essentially with codes, coded behavior, uh, coded language, coded expression, coded dress sense, coded uh, embodiment, etc. Right? So the entire idea of coding and decoding and recoding is something which we are very, very interested in, especially looking at gender uh, from different perspectives. Now, throughout this course, uh, we, we had mainly stuck with um, the, the, a binaristic understanding of gender. So we talked about male performativity, we talked about female performativity, uh, you know, we haven't really exploded, uh, or explored, sorry, um, you know, the other possibilities of gender, the transgender possibilities, right, which is something that we extensively and increasingly uh, find, uh, you know, very, very encouragingly uh, in our, you know, the daily discourses of our life. So the, the transgender phenomenon, the transgender embodiment, right, which is, which, which inhabits a, a different space, which inhabits a space outside uh, of uh, the very neat binary of male and female, right, which is obviously performative, which is obviously, you know, mutable, but which obviously generates certain kinds of identities which do not conform to either the male or the female, but, you know, it's a very playful, uh, you know, performative kind of an identity which is constantly performed and produced uh, through different forms of embodiment.
Okay? So, the transgender uh, embodiment, the transgender performativity is something that we uh, should also be looking at and I am sure you, you can find examples in many films, you can find examples in many stories uh, that you know that, that really dramatize this kind of performativity. Right? But again, even the transgender uh, performativity, even the transgender identity is something that should be studied in its relation to speciality, in its relation to space. Right, because space is something that which produces identities, which is sort of you know negotiates with identities. Every identity is operative in a certain space. Every identity is operative in a certain kind of a spatial politics. Right, you cannot have an identity without an understanding of space, without the association of space uh, around that particular identity. Okay, now. Having talked about space in some details and having uh, talked about the, the very interesting uh, entanglement of space, gender, identity, uh, embodiment, etcetera. Now, we will move on to the little clipping that we will see today from a very famous film called The Godfather. And this little clipping is about uh, you know uh, different kinds of embodiment coming together and how there is a dominant form of embodiment and there, are, there is an inadequate uh, you know, order of embodiment and how the dominant form of embodiment uh, basically uh, you know corrects uh, coexist and corrects the inadequate form of embodiment and of course the other thing which you will see over here is a very interesting spatial mapping uh, of gendered embodiment so you know there is this um, you know very interesting um, masculine mapping of embodiment there is this very interesting uh, female mapping of embodiment and what this particular clipping shows is how the two forms of embodiment uh, correspond to each other how does this sort of a neat division uh, in terms of space uh, very interestingly through a particular threshold there is actually literally a threshold this very liminal space which through which the two different forms of embodiment uh, map into each other. So, in, if you cross a certain door you move into the female space you cross a door from the other side you move into a male space. So, this crossing of doors which is a very liminal activity is something that we see extensively in this particular scene. So, the liminality uh, which is a other term which I wanted to bring in uh, in this lecture the liminality is a very important concept uh, in gender studies like performativity. So, what is liminality? So, liminality is this idea of moving between uh, the between spaces, between zones, between identities, between uh, you know, categories. So, liminality is this in between condition uh, or the, the, the process of you know in betweenness. Uh, so, you know it is an identity of in betweenness. Right. So, you know, if you're inhabiting in betweenness, you're essentially inhabiting liminality. Right. So, liminality or the liminal condition uh, is a condition where you are aware of both the conditions on either side. So, again, this is something which uh, problematizes any understanding, any idea of binaries, any idea of dualism, and a discourse of dualism. So, liminality is a very important term in gender studies in relation to performativity and embodiment because liminality is a possibility as well as a departure. Right. It is pointing towards something, it is pointing towards a possibility, but at the same time it is a departure away from a certain kind of existence. Right. So, again it is a playful, performative, plastic, mutable phenomenon. So, you know, if, if you just use this term and go back to something like Twelfth Night by William Shakespeare, uh, that particular comedy which we uh, you know discuss in some details in this particular course uh, and you can expect questions on it, on it of course. Uh, Twelfth Night is all about the liminality of gendered identities. Right. It is about uh, you know constantly being in between uh, two gendered identities and this is completely irrespective, uh, this is completely unrelated to the biological understanding of gender. So, we have women uh, you know who obviously you know who inhabit uh, the, the, the performative embodiment of men while at the same time being biologically women uh, and you know, you know women in uh, the biological sense of the term. So, again this constant play between the biological entity and performative entity is done precisely through liminality. So, liminality is a concept I think is a very key term in gender studies because it sort of encaptures, encapsulates the entire process of vacillation, the entire process of transition, the entire process of you know formation and reformation and deformation which we had talked about. You know because you know even in advertisements uh, and if you go back to the ads which you have seen and we find that even in advertisements there is a process of breaking away from a certain norm, but then again re-establishing a different alternative norm. So, you know in most occasions advertisements they rely on the normative closure, uh, they rely on a particular normative principle. Now, it can be a different normative principle from the erstwhile principle, it can depart from the earlier normative principle, but 
often, more, most often than not, uh, no, more often than not, they end with a certain kind of normative principle. It's not free from normativity at all. The very free advertisements which are free from normativity because, you know, all advertisements, they rely or they aspire or they tend to acquire a certain degree of closure, right? Because, you know, that is how, you know, the commodity formation will, will be best facilitated through a closure, right? So, you, you come to a closure uh, and that is basically the process in which, you know, an entity becomes or converts into a commodity, right? Through a closure. So, you know, even in advertisements, we have a little, we, we have hints of liminality, we have suggestions of liminality, we have operations of liminality, uh, which are more often than not, uh, you know, you know, they, they end with closures, they end with certain kind of, uh, you know, coded closure, uh, which helps us to facilitate, which, which consolidates, uh, you know, which consolidates the very neat gender divisions, uh, subdivisions, identifications, uh, and of course, uh, you know, deformations in different uh, disguises. Okay, so in you know, a closure and liminality, they are sort of ontological opposites of each other, right? So you know, liminality uh, in its very ontological definition is opposed to closure. Because liminality is straight of in betweenness. It's, it's something which uh, you know really encaptures or encapsulates the process of traveling between two points. Uh, you know, it's o it's opening up to a new world. It's, it's sort of closing down to another world. And this process of opening and closing, they happen simultaneously sometimes through a loop. So, you know, liminality itself becomes a very important phenomenon in gender studies. Okay, now. Taking all this into consideration, uh, you know, the idea of liminality, the idea of performativity, the idea of embodiment, and how are all these terms related to speciality, right? The production of space. And how is this production of space important uh, in, in, in terms of gender, in terms of the production of gendered identities? So, to what extent is a production of space, uh, you know, in, to what extent does it inform a production of gendered identities? You know, is gender you know, uh, insensitive to space, or should gender be studied only as something which is related to space? Right? Now, space, of course, space, time, value system, moral maps, um, ideological uh, principles, uh, as I keep saying uh, in the, you know, maybe in almost all, each of my lectures. So, all these are deeply and asymmetrically enmeshed uh, in any understanding of gender. So, you cannot really uh, look at gender as, some, as a phenomenon which is divorced from space, divorced from time, uh, divorced from an understanding of politics, divorced from a religious, social, cultural principle. So, all these principles, all these conditions are deeply connected to each other in the production of certain kinds of gendered identities. Okay? Now, uh, having given you this preamble, having given you uh, hopefully an understanding of how space works in terms of producing gendered identities through a liminal performative process, I now move into uh, the particular scene which I'll play uh, in, a, in a minute on the screen. Now, this will give you an idea of the background to the scene. So, this is a clip from the film called Godfather and you know, it's a very famous film. I'm sure most of you have seen the film or you know, I'm sure almost all of you have heard of the film. Uh, it's a gangster film. Uh, it's, it's about a mafia family in America, an Italian mafia family and how does the family operate uh, through certain principles of violence, certain principles of preservation, certain principles of uh, you know, uh, you know, hierarchy and, and occupation, etc. Now, the scene that I'm interested in, the scene that I'll sort of screen, I'll show you in a, in a, in a minute. Uh, that that is a scene which comes after a particular wedding ceremony in the Godfather. So we have the Godfather sitting in his office, uh, and he's in conversation with his godson, uh, you know, Johnny Fontana. Now, Johnny, uh, the godson of the Godfather, is a, is a Hollywood actor. He's a bit of a singing actor. So he is this uh, Italian actor uh, who sings as well as acts, which you know belongs to a certain tradition, uh, you know, stereotypically uh, from Rudolf Valentino, you know, the Italian good-looking guy who sings and acts at the same time. So that is a very uh, sort of a cultural, racial stereotype in Hollywood as well, uh, which is a time in which Godfather is sort of set, you know, in the 60s Hollywood, uh, you know, and that is a time that is a contemporary time, you know, in which uh, you know the film is based. Now, what happens in the scene is uh, very simply put this. So, this godson of the godfather, the Hollywood actor singer, uh, he comes up to the godfather at the end of the wedding ceremony, uh, having sung a song, having wooed the ladies uh, in the wedding. And he comes and complains about a particular producer in Hollywood who would not give him uh, the role that he wants because, you know, there's a role that he had really hoped uh, to get, uh, a role that, you know, he, he thinks would have really uh, you know, resurrected his career, uh, make, made, made him a sensation again. But the producer doesn't give him the role, or hadn't given him the role because of certain reasons. And there's, a, there's an indication that maybe they've fallen out over some very personal issues, perhaps, uh, you know, about some amorous issues uh, around uh, a lady, but we don't quite know. 
for sure in this particular scene. But the point is they have fallen out, uh, the godson and the producer as a result of which uh, Johnny the godson does not get the role that he wants uh, and he comes and complains to the godfather. He does not really complain, he breaks down before the godfather, uh, you know, starts to sob, uh, starts to weep. Uh, and then the godfather obviously had been listening to him for a long time but then he gets up very, very impatiently and slaps him uh, and tells him to act like a man, right? And this is a very key thing, uh, you know, you can act like a man uh, which is what, you know, the godfather played the Marlon Brando uh, tells Johnny Fontana, you know, so to act like a man, uh, to man up in other words. So again, you know, I'll play the, the scene right now but then again notice how acting like a man or manning up uh, is almost in the form of elevation, it's a form of, you know, elevated embodiment, right? You're manning up into something, uh, you are into something superior. So, you had been broken, you had fallen into some kind of a, a nadi and now you're manning up in order to elevate yourself existentially in some kind of a, a, a position. So, again, the entire idea of acting like a man, uh, it, it sort of entails uh, elevation, it entails promotion, it entails a uh, certain kind of uh, a promoted behavior, a promoted superior embodiment, right? And of course, uh, you know, the godfather tells this to the godson, he says, you can act like a man and then of course, uh, he tells him that, you know, your, your problems were taken care of and those of us who seen the film, uh, we, we know how the problems are taken care of through a very grotesque and gory method but you know, we don't want to go into it but those of you who seen the film would know this. But the point is, um, you know, the godfather assures him that his problems will be taken care of and he sends off Johnny into the other room. Now, this is an interesting bit again, uh, you know, when Johnny is about to leave the room of the godfather, the, you know, so far in that room we had just men. So, it's an all male space and they, the men, it's not just men, but they're dressed in a particular way. And this is a very complex bit and I'll talk about that when we play the screen, the, when we screen the film, so when, when we screen the film, sorry. So, uh, we find that the men are dressed in a particular way uh, which is indicative of their manly status. Now, in that particular setting, in that kind of a sartorial setting, Johnny is a bit of a, uh, you know, he is, you know, a bit of a, a misfit because he wears a dress which does not quite fit in uh, into the other kinds of dresses that the men are wearing. So, this is sort of very, very strange. Uh, and, but it's quite deliberate as well because you know the, the idea is to uh, promote him or to portray him uh, as this uh, other kind of man, someone who is not really manly enough, uh, someone who is not really, uh, doesn't really fit in this mafia masculinity that the godfather and his uh, managers are embodying. Right? Now, he is obviously, he represents or he embodies inadequate masculinity as a result of which he's sent off uh, into the other room uh, where we have a glimpse of a kitchen, right? And the door opens and Johnny is sent into the kitchen and he's asked to, you know, relax, take a bath, uh, you know, get a grip and move on, etc. Now, the interesting thing is when the door opens and we see a glimpse of the kitchen, we just see women uh, chopping vegetables, wearing aprons, right? Now, that is, again, that's a very clear and sexist and rigid and crude mapping of, you know, gendered spaces. So, whereas uh, the mafia space of the men uh, is completely masculine, uh, people are wearing certain kinds of dresses, they're talking a certain kind of behavior, you know, they exhibit certain kind of behavior, it's very coded, very strictly coded and Johnny obviously there is not really coded enough. So, he is insufficiently masculine over there, but interestingly when he's sent into the kitchen to a, and this is a very liminal door which opens and he sort of moves him from the mafia office into the kitchen. So, the movement is from an all male, alpha male position uh, to a space which is female. So, he's almost, uh, it's almost as if he is sort of sent off to a space where he fits in more because he does not seem to sort of quote unquote fit into this alpha male masculine space that a godfather uh, inhabits with his cronies uh, in this particular scene. So, the whole thing, the whole idea, the whole package, the whole uh, scene from the godfather is a very coded scene, right? It is coded into different kinds of gendered identity. So, you know, Johnny represents a certain kind of gendered identity, the godfather represents a certain kind of gendered identity, the woman uh, in the kitchen uh, chopping vegetables, wearing aprons, they represent a certain kind of gendered identities and it is all very neatly mapped out. You know, they do not really flow into each other, they do not really, uh, you know, problematize one another at all. So, Johnny is sort of sent from one room to another room uh, in, uh, in, in response to his inadequate masculinity, right? And the whole idea uh, is to make him look less manly than the other men. And obviously, the idea to show the woman wearing aprons, cutting vegetables uh, is to sort of exhibit that th that is a female space which has got nothing to do with the mafia conversations that are happening in this particular room. So, having given you this is the content of the scene. So, having given you the content, having given you, uh, you know, what really transpires in the scene, I am going to play the scene right now 
uh, and then we'll see how the whole thing operates. So on your screen, we'll have the film, a uh, little clipping from the film Godfather and the particular scene where, uh, you know, Johnny comes into the room and, you know, breaks down, etc. And then we'll look at how this entire, uh, the entire scene really becomes a very coded scene in terms of gender studies. So the scene is coming up on the screen in a minute. I don't know what to do. My voice is, is weak. It's weak. Anyway, uh, if I had this part in the picture, you know, it puts me right back up on top again. But this, uh, this man out there, he, he won't give it to me. The head of the studio. What's his name? Uh, Waltz. Waltz. He, he won't give it to me. And uh, he says, there's no chance. No chance. A month ago, he bought the movie rights to this book, a bestseller. And the main character is a guy just like me. I, uh, you know, I wouldn't even have to act. Just be myself. And, uh, oh, Godfather, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. You can act like a man! What's the matter with you? Is this how you turn down a Hollywood Pinocchio that uh, cries like a woman? <laughs> what can I do? What can I do? What is that nonsense? Look at You spend time with your family? Sure I do. Good. Because a man who doesn't spend time with his family can never be a real man. Mm. You look terrible. I want you to eat. I want you to rest well, and a month from now, this Hollywood big shot's gonna give you what you want. It's too late. They start shooting in a week. I'm gonna make him an offer he can't refuse. Just go outside, enjoy yourself, and forget about all this nonsense. Listen, I want you to leave all to me. All right. Yeah. So, you just saw the, the little scene from the film that, you know, I've been talking about for so long. So obviously, you know, you can replay it and I'll perhaps replay it in a minute. But, you know, just to take you through all the things that I've talked about. So look at the gendered mapping of the space over here. The scene starts with a very, very masculine space. It's mafia and masculinity, right? So all the people are wearing a certain kind of dress. They're speaking a certain kind of way. They have a certain kind of embodiment. And it's all very pronounced, right? Uh, and it, it's obviously completely coded, as I just mentioned. Now, in this very coded uh, space, we have a man wearing a white suit, uh, which is a wedding singer's suit, a wedding singer's dress, which is obviously not fitting in uh, into this other mafia dress, uh, the very black suits, the Italian suits that the other mafia men are wearing. So, you know, it's a bit of an incompatible intrusion. Uh, you know, it's, it's sort of inadequate, it's incompatible, it's not really fitting in uh, into the other uh, masculine forms of embodiment in this particular scene. So. The interesting thing over here is, so the fact is Johnny is also biologically a male. Uh, he is a man just like the godfather, just like the godfather's manager, just like the godfather's uh, eldest son who comes in, uh, you know. So they're all men, but they are differently masculine, right? So the masculinity quotient is different uh, because despite being biologically men, men, males uh, or men, uh, they are actually differently masculinized. So Johnny happens to be uh, he happens to embody a different kind of masculinity, which is probably uh, quote unquote inadequate uh, or insufficient from the lenses of and you know, from the perspective of the mafia masculinity. So the mafia masculinity uh, is sort of more controlled, more Machiavellian, or uh, uh, you know they obviously are more violent. Uh, you know you can see. I mean, you could, I'm sure you heard the little line that you know the Godfather told Johnny that you know I'm going to make him an offer that I can't refuse. Uh, so he's talking about the producer of Hollywood, uh, and he says I'm going to persuade him. Uh, to take you in that in the film, uh, which is you know what Johnny is complaining about that you know he was been kicked out of a production, right? So the Godfather tells him that you know don't worry about it. You just go back, and dress up, you know, take a good bath, uh, freshen up, and I'm going to deal with this in my own way. Uh, and you know in a week's time, the, the Hollywood producer will call you and you'll be in the film, right? And I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. So the very implicit the violence in the tone. Uh, which is not really spelled out, but it's a very cold kind of a violence. That, again, so look at the language uh, of the Godfather over here. The language is sort of hyper-masculine, uh, hyper-masculinized. 
uh, especially compared to Johnny's language. Because Johnny's language is more, uh, it's sort of almost hysteric. So again, look at the way in which this very sexist division between the hysteric man and the non-hysteric man, the hysteric man and the Machiavellian man is played out in this particular scene, right? So the hysteric man is almost equated with a woman. So you know, just because it's not Machiavellian, just because it's not cold and clinical uh, and calm in terms of its violent embodiment, uh, he is considered to be uh, uh, a bit of a sissy, and he's mocked at in the scene, as you just saw. So the Godfather parodies him. So you know, you're just breaking down like a child. You're breaking down like a woman, not a child. A woman. So he says, you know, and obviously he parodies Johnny to a certain extent. He mocks uh, his sobbing. He mocks his breakdown. Uh, and because, you know, he's very, very disappointed, as he says, with his insufficient masculinity. And so the point is, uh, Johnny's quote unquote insufficient masculinity is very easily equated with femininity, with, with female behavior, stereotypical female behavior. So he is this hysteric man uh, who is sent off to the female space uh, at the end of the scene. And of course, when the, the, the little door opens, uh, this very liminal transition from one space to another space, which we just saw, uh, that, you know, look at the binary of the two spaces. So this is this Machiavellian all male, alpha male space uh, where the mafia men sit and discuss uh, about killing each other, about contracts, about businesses, so all the quote unquote manly things. Whereas the woman in the household, they're inside the kitchen chopping vegetables and doing the womanly thing. So it's a very crude binary, right? And the crudity is interesting over here because, you know, this is the kind of crudity which the film depicts. And it was a, obviously, as you know, it was a smashing hit. Uh, it was a huge success in the box office. And even today, people watch it uh, with lots of reference. It was a very finely made film. But, you know, the content of the film, the kind of culture which is shown in the film, uh, it's really, really crude. It's Machiavellian, uh, you know, it's something which really doesn't have any gray areas in terms of the gendered binaries and gender divisions. So the men belong somewhere, the woman belongs somewhere else. Uh, there's no merge of the two. Uh, and whoever is insufficiently masculine, uh, despite being a male, uh, is sort of sent off to the kitchen space where uh, he would inhabit, uh, he would share with the other woman who greet him. With and all the women, they seem to be chopping vegetables in the same way. Where they're all wearing aprons. So again, the entire sartorial politics of the scene is really important. So the men dress in a particular way, uh, they behave in a particular way, uh, they speak in a particular way, they walk in a particular way, and all that together comes together uh, into forming or generating a certain kind of embodiment, right? And we talk about embodiment as a uh, as a merging process, as a neural process, as well as a discursive process, right? It's something which you happen, uh, which you do uh, through your brain, through your body, through your nerves. A tree of uh, you know organic process, but at the same time, it's also a discursive process. So this entire uh, interplay between the discursive and the organic is something which constitutes embodiment in, in the proper sense of the word. So the entire order of embodiment in this particular scene is a very hyper masculine mafia kind of masculinity, right? So you know they dress in a way. It's, they're very clinical. They're very Machiavellian. They're very cold. Uh, they're very persuasive without really being uh, you know um, assertive about it. So they, they get the work done, in other words, right? And the entire idea of getting the work done uh, is something that you know, the mafia masculinity represents in this particular scene. Whereas Johnny, who is also a male, uh, who is a desirable male, uh, you know, because he's a wedding singer, he acts in Hollywood, etc., he becomes an insufficiently uh, you know, masculinized figure in this particular space. So again, it is the space which determines the quantity, the quotient of masculinity, the quotient of femininity, uh, and to what extent are these related to the biological, you know, are these biologically determined, and to what extent are these socially constructed or discursively constructed. Now, in this particular case, we can see clearly that it's a discursive formation. Right, the entire embodiment is a very discursive process. You need to behave in a particular way. You need to behave in a particular, you need to speak in a particular way. You need to dress in a particular way in order to qualify as a manly man in that kind of a setting. In other words, you need to conform to certain codes very, very clearly and categorically if you are to be considered to be manly enough. And if you're not manly enough, uh, he is laughed at. So he's a sissy boy uh, very, very quickly because he cannot confirm. Uh, he cannot really uh, you know, conform to the codes of conduct in that particular space. So he's a sissy boy by default. He's laughed at, he's mocked at. Uh, his embodiment is uh, you know, really parodied and, 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 gr and very grotesquely lampooned by the godfather uh, you know, who mimics it uh, in a very, very uh, you know, um, you know, irreverential way. And then obviously Johnny is sent back to the kitchen uh, you know, uh, to, to share the space with women because you know, he's not really manly enough. Now, interestingly, uh, in one particular scene, uh, and I'll play it again, but in one particular 
section in the scene, you find that the uh, Sonny uh, uh, Colleone, the, the elder, uh, the uh, son of the godfather, he enters. Uh, and obviously those of you who have read the book and seen the film would know that he is this alpha male figure uh, who is even more alpha male than the godfather. And obviously he, he doesn't spend time with his family, he has other affairs outside. Um, amorous affairs, uh, commercial ventures, etc. He doesn't. He's hardly around in the house. So you know that kind of a hyper masculinity. That's that's like an extreme hyper masculinity. That is a critique by the Godfather when he says that a man who doesn't spend time with the family cannot be considered as a real man. So again, the definitions are very uh, codified definitions. So you need not to be a, you need to be a Christian man as well. So again, the entire idea of the mafia masculinity as a norm, uh, it was you know, very interestingly related to the Catholic Church. So the entire mafia culture which came from Italy, uh, southern bit of Italy actually, uh, Sicilian um, you know, uh, kind of masculinity, the entire, and almost the entirety of the, uh, the, the big mafia families, they sort of belong to that particular region. And interestingly, it was also a very religious kind of masculinity. So on the one hand, they were doing contract killings. On the one hand, they were very violent. On the one hand, they were very, very gruesome in their activities, but at the same time, they were extremely religious people, uh, you know, who belong to the Catholic Church, who are blessed by the Catholic Church. And if you look at the Mafia rituals, uh, the, the very coded bodily rituals of the Mafia, uh, you know, it was very, very Catholic. So it was very uh, closely corresponding to the Catholic rituals uh, of the Church at that point in time, uh, which also preached uh, spending time with the family. So again, part of the masculinity package is not just being aggressive or violent and getting the work done or doing contract killing, but also spending time with the family, uh, being faithful to the family. So if you're not faithful to the family, you're not considered to be a real man. This is what you know, the Godfather tells deliberately uh, in order to, um, you know, uh, critique uh, or you know, sort of reprimand his eldest son who is hardly around in the house. So this is something of a, of a lesson that he gives Johnny, the insufficient uh, masculine figure that you know, in order to be a real man, uh, you need also, along with killing people, along with being aggressive, along with, along with being clinical and Machiavellian, you also need to spend time with your family. If you don't do it, you cannot really be a real man. So again, the entire package of masculinity, I look at the way how Things like religion, language, uh, dress, food, embodiment, all these come together to create and generate a certain kind of identity which is tied to a particular space. And also, space is interesting, even more complex, because we're talking about one house. And this is why I began this lecture with a reference to Chatham Circulari or the chess players, because even there, in the Prem Chat story, we have one house, right? But inside the one house, we have a subdivision of spaces. So there's this male space, there's this female space. Um, there is a space where a woman must not enter because it's almost entirely inhabited by the men, etc. Right? So the whole idea is to map out the division of spaces and generate identities related to the spaces, uh, very gendered identities. Okay? So that's the whole uh, idea of this particular scene. And the reason why we studied it is to look at the way uh, the spaces change, the spaces shift into each other, uh, but at the same time they remain different. Right? Because they, are, they correspond to different kinds of embodiment, this masculine embodiment, this feminine embodiment, uh, you know, and how the two don't really mix with each other. So how if you're insufficiently masculine, despite being a biological male, you're sent off to the woman, with the woman in the kitchen space. And again, the proximity uh, of the two spaces is very, very interesting. We're talking about this mafia, you know, this office space of the mafia where men are men sit together and think of uh, you know, doing contract killing and running businesses, sometimes illegal businesses. But you know, just cross the door, uh, cross the threshold, uh, very, very liminal threshold, and you enter a different kind of space. Women are just taking care of the house or the kitchen, running the family, etc. Right? So again, the, the proximity of the two spaces is very, very problematic. But at the same time, they're so, they're so different ontologically uh, and discursively, right? Because they belong to two different orders of gendered activities, two different orders of gendered embodiment. And this is what the particular scene uh, really showcases and dramatizes. So just to conclude uh, this particular lecture, uh, there's a very complex relationship between space and gendered identity, right? So you cannot really have a gendered identity uh, when a, which is not related to, to a certain kind of space, certain kind of speciality, or certain kind of spatial politics. Uh, so the politics of production uh, of identity is related to the politics of speciality as well. So what kind of space are you looking at? So what is a space, uh, to what extent is a space discursive? So a discursive quality of a space really produces a certain kind of identity, uh, which is deeply gendered immediately. So a space becomes gendered. And again, this brings us back to uh, some of the things which we talked about in the last couple of lectures, especially when we look at the advertisements. Now, in advertisements, we find oftentimes uh, commodities which have nothing to do with biological maleness or femaleness, 
they very quickly become discursively uh, gendered uh, commodities, gendered entities, right? And the entire process of conversion from an entity to a commodity uh, is through a gendered process on many occasions. So motorbikes are gendered, uh, you know, uh, you know, certain drinks, uh, certain beverages are gendered, uh, male or female, uh, you know, uh, shoes are gendered, uh, dresses are gendered, uh, you know. So all different kinds of um, inanimate objects which have got nothing to do with biological uh, you know determinism they're not biological determined at all so they become very quickly gendered very discursive process right so likewise space which is this, you know which you'd imagine to be a neutral category you know, in gender studies is not neutral at all is deeply biased is deeply pointed and is deeply problematic and discursive uh, in becoming a certain kind of a gendered uh, capsule where men come in and women come in and different kinds of behavior takes place now interesting and I'll conclude with this if we remember the the Yorkie advertisement which we played uh, in the in a couple of lectures ahead you know uh, ago where we started looking at advertisements and looking at how uh, advertisements produce different kinds of identities. Now, I mentioned in the advertisement that, you know, it's not just enough that the woman who dresses up as a man, you know, uh, becomes a man. He, it's also essential that she knows all the manly markers of knowledge, which includes the offside rule of football, which includes uh, a knowledge of vulgar uh, slang, uh, t slang talks, man talks, uh, you know, uh, about women, which includes uh, fearlessness, uh, you know, especially when a, uh, a spider is sprung on you, which includes physical strength, especially when opening a jar is concerned, etc. So all these manly metonymic markers. So these things are also important. Now, I'd, I'd mention a hypothetical situation where I suppose a biological male had entered that space and, 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 and requested for a Yorkie chocolate. Uh, if he was subjected to the same series of tests, and he did not, if he did not care about football, if he was afraid of uh, spiders, if he did not have the strength to open a jar, uh, if he did not know dirty man talk, uh, would he still be given the Yorkie chocolate? Uh, probably not, because you know it's not just about being uh, a man in the biological sense of the word. Because Johnny, in this particular scene from The Godfather, is very much biologically a man. So we, we know we have no uh, ambivalence about that. He's a man. He's dressed like a man. He talks like a man. He behaves like a man, etc. But again, uh, he's he he has you know maleness, but not really masculinity in this particular space. And it's very very relative. Uh, who is masculine, who is not masculine is dependent and determined largely uh, in, uh, by the politics of the space. So, this particular space demands a certain kind of masculinity which Johnny cannot deliver and as a result of which he is mocked at, he is you know, lampooned uh, mercilessly by the godfather and then sent off to the kitchen where he can inhabit with the woman uh, you know, and, and, and the suggestion is you know, that is the kind of embodiment that he is more comfortable uh, in, in, in sort of getting back at. So he doesn't really belong to this mafia masculine space despite his maleness, despite his biological maleness and he's sent off to the kitchen uh, you know, because that's where it's almost like a punishment or like a parody of his insufficient masculinity. Right? So I hope I have established uh, through the course of this lecture the very complex relation between gender, gendered identity and space and how spatial identity, how spatial production of gender identities is a very complex discursive process which completely transgresses or transcends rather uh, any kind of biological determinism. Right? So the biological determinism is unimportant over here, it is not so much about biology at all, it is actually about the discursive strategies, the discursive forms of embodiment through which uh, you achieve and acquire a certain kind of masculinity, a certain kind of femininity which become dominant uh, you know, in certain kind of spatial, um, you know, uh, you know, spatial location or spatial production. Because every spatial production it necessitates uh, a dominant masculinity, a dominant femininity, a dominant gendered identity which would be the hegemonic identity which you are required to conform to. If you can't conform to it, uh, then obviously you, are, you become a misfit there by default and then you are sent off and lampooned uh, and parodied because of your insufficient identification. Right? And of course, uh, you know, the entire idea of identification, the entire idea of becoming an identity is through a process of identification. Now you can over identify, you can over appropriate or you can under identify and under appropriate. And what happens in this case is an example of uh, you know, insufficient appropriation. So, Johnny uh, does not really, you know, he is not really manly enough uh, to be considered masculine in this particular space. So, because of his insufficient appropriation of this order of mafia masculinity. So, you know, this is a really, really interesting scene in terms of looking at it from the perspective of embodiment, gendered identity, the spatial production of identity and of course, the very fundamental mapping of spaces in terms of gendered location.
So please play this video again. Uh, please look at it again uh, and, and uh, think of the ways in which you can find out more readings uh, from this particular scene. If possible, see the whole film. It's a very fine film, but it depicts a certain kind of culture which very crudely divides uh, the male from the female, uh, the manly behavior from the womanly behavior. And you know, it's almost like a sanctioned division because it's sanctioned by uh, you know the state. It's sanctioned by the church. It's sanctioned by the language. It's sanctioned by the different kinds of embodiment which are rampant in that film. Right? I hope you enjoy the lecture and, and I look forward to seeing you in the last lecture of this particular course. Thank you very much for your attention.